Welcome back to the Zao Strength Podcast. This is your host, Jim Ellie, and this is the 15th episode of the uh, Zao Strength Podcast, season two. Today, we will be speaking with the one and only Matt Vina from Canada, Canadian powerlifter. He's been blowing up on YouTube, uh, hacking the algorithms, but he also has caught my eye even before he started YouTube, mostly because of just like how strong he is and how he's been able to progress in the last few years. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do with the recent episodes is to learn about how athletes think about their training and how that interacts with how they coach and, and the kind of dynamic between the two. So in this episode, we'll talk a little bit about our programming similarities, our coaching similarities and differences and how that plays out when it comes to kind of creative problem solving. So. Hopefully you enjoy this episode, and without further ado, let's get into the podcast. Uh, I was just mentioning earlier, before you, or when you jumped in, um, one of the things I'm really curious about you, Matt, is that uh, like you just kind of hopped onto YouTube and just started sending it with your videos. And I think you got like a, a million views in like your first few months or something. Yeah, so basically, I had a people married me lifting compilation video that I just uploaded, and then like... I never really paid attention to my YouTube channel for like months, but I'd get like the occasional notification by Gmail, like somebody so and so commented or whatever. And then I checked in like, I don't know how many months later and I saw it had like hundreds of thousands of views. And I was like, oh, I guess I could really like, you know, actually make it like uh, grow my community on YouTube. And then I started uploading more regularly then. Yeah. How did you end up like why did you even start uploading there in the first place like what was what was the inspiration well, i guess i just always thought like maybe one day i could transfer like i had a good instagram following right but it's a lot harder to make living off instagram versus youtube youtube you get actual ad revenue you get yeah. sponsors better so it's kind of just like you know thinking one day i'll convert it to youtube but never really following through i upload the odd video here and there odd lift and then that video and then once it actually started getting you know on the algorithm getting recommended to people tons of views then i was like okay now i can start taking this seriously i should actually put effort in i find that youtube it, i'm like a perfectionist so i find that youtube is really intimidating um especially because of the people that i watch like i i, I don't know i really watch a lot of like tech tech youtubers and stuff and it seems like they just have everything really polished and um even though the powerlifting scene isn't super polished like you only have a few people I, I, really the only people i watch uh, is calgary barbell uh I, johnny candido has been kind of off and on with videos i used to watch him a lot when i was younger and uh david wilson has been uploading recently too and i, I watch his stuff but like other than that there's not a lot of guys on youtube like did you feel intimidated as well when you right, started? Yeah, I noticed that too. I was like, this is really unsaturated market. Um, you know, I tried to, I really like enjoying watching just people's training logs. Like I just like have it on the background and like to see their process. I was watching, um, what's his name? Swim hack, that guy, the big bencher. I was watching his training logs and it made me think like, you know, there's not a lot of this powerlifting content on YouTube. I should get into this. But then, yeah, you look at people like Johnny, their videos are like, incredibly like well edited like he's like master like super into all that and i'm not at all like i basically just cut the clips and that's it i don't know like much about camera work and stuff but i was just thinking like you gotta start somewhere you know you if you wait for perfection you're never gonna actually do anything yeah well i have like a full studio in here <laughs> and like i'm like all right this is the time i'll get my video up there and everyone's gonna love it you know like but uh, because I think like that, it's <clears throat> it's hard to get it in. It's hard to get it out there. Um, and so I honestly, watching your videos, I'm like, well, you have a really cool way of talking about things. Like you, you're able to just be really concise, I suppose, um, and convincing. But you, you also have a, other videos where you're kind of trying to just help help lifters like think differently, like. Uh, some of your shorts, for example, it's just like, Hey, you know, there's some nuance here to technique, like not everyone lifts the same. Um, but then like the tutorial videos are just pretty straightforward. You know, you talk about the lift for a while. If I recall, there wasn't many edits. Maybe you added some footage of people in the background, but like pretty, pretty simple. And 
I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of like looking up at the mountain, like, man, 15,000 views on one of these videos, like not to offend you, but you didn't really do much on the cutting side to yeah, make it, I, I know to make sure. it very special. Yeah. Um, I was basically just thinking like, I'm going to go focus on the message rather than the editing and then try and learn about editing later. But yeah, that concise thing, like I think with the YouTube shorts, it just kind of forces you like, you know, you've got like a minute limit and then like oftentimes I'd just like record it and I'd be out of time. And I'd realize I'd only gone through like half of what I wanted to say and I got to re-record, be really concise. So I think that helped make me like, you know, get your point across really quickly. Don't like add in all this like fluff stuff, just get straight to the point. Mm. Yeah. I, I <laughs> Speaking of like straight to the point, I uh, had a video go like viral or whatever not really it was on like fifteen thousand views on tiktok the other day but it was like a response video to someone else just like deadlifting <laughs> it was like a guy or no it was a teen lifter and he had like seven hundred thousand views on it and i responded to it because he was like 17 or something and he was squatting like 550 and i was just saying like this newer generation of lifters is really strong and it's like crazy impressive um and that's it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like everyone uh, to me, I would never think that type of video would blow up. You yeah, know what I mean? That was a bit of a surprise to me on TikTok too. I realized like a lot of people don't need to say much and they'll just get tons of views. And then you'll see like other people like giving out these really like effortful videos and they just get like nothing. That's yeah. Yeah. I hate it. It's kinda I I, I, I like I hate that, but I also it might help with my perfectionism a little bit. Um, but I don't know, transitioning away kind of from, from content, I just think that that's really cool. And that's why, one. it's not why I wanted to talk with you. I actually mostly wanted to talk with you about kind of how you approach your own training. Um, and I've had a few other people on and talk with them about like how the pandemic has impacted things. How has it shifted or, or not shifted? Like how you approach volume or, or frequency or whatever. So for those of, the people watching or listening that don't hear anything, uh, sorry, don't know anything about you, <laughs> can't hear. Um, what would you tell them like as a general philosophy for your own training? So I would say like my number one training philosophy, and this is just based on like looking at my past cycles when I made the most progress is like I saw a consistent trend, like when I could do the most volume, that's when I got the best results. So now I'm basically... The way I see it, I try and manipulate all the variables to get the most volume in that I can. So generally my programming is very low intensity in terms of like relative um, proximity to failure. And I'm doing like higher frequency. So, you know, it's easier to get like um, more frequent sessions in. you can get more volume in that way. And I use typically quite a bit of variation. Again, just easier to get more volume in versus just straight sets with one exercise more overuse yeah have you because that's the thing i remember like in 2015 like every i seem like almost every coach is like uh really into uh all right we're gonna do squat bench and deadlift three four times a week uh, you know whatever combination whether you squat three times a week bench four five six even and then deadlift two three times a week not really much variation uh, you mentioned that you follow kind of like the daily undulated periodized approach, um, or at least for those who don't know, it's like one day you're focusing on certain intensity and then the other you're, you're focusing on higher intensities. Do you still follow that approach or is that? Yeah. Changed? Yeah, I still do. Um, what got me into that is I was just looking into like um, research on periodization and um, there seems to be like a general favoring of daily undulating versus block periodization. Um I don't think it's perfect research. There's like, I know Greg Knuckles had a great article on it, but there's like issues like looking at short term versus long term. And like, it could be like when you're doing a daily undulating, you're more used to high intensity work. So possibly if you had block periodization with a proper peak, it wouldn't make a difference. But anyways, I just thought at best, there's not really a difference between the two. And at, or sorry, at worst, there's not really a difference between the two. At best, it's a slight favoring, so may as well do daily undulating. <clears throat> One of the, I guess, ways in which I approach that concept is, um, it's it's like I almost every program I've ever written has a unintentional or intentional undulation and in, in, um, volume intensity, um, effort, whatever RPE, and 
it just seems like it makes sense to not differentiate days, you know, on their own, like have the fluctuation happen organically. And almost instead of like it being a, a, I guess a term, it's more like we can train anything you want on any of the days that you want to, and you'll be okay. There's not a need to like, we're only doing hypertrophy (laughs) on one day. Like we're only doing strength on this day as if like your body really knows the difference, you know, between the two. It's like, do you, do you, do you think about it? Like, all right, I'm doing hypertrophy this day. I'm doing my strength stuff now. And then I'm doing my intensity stuff on, on day three or whatever. Or do you think of it more as like the gradient of, of intensities that it, kind of is right i I kind of do it like um splitting it up individually like this is going to be my low rep higher intensity day this can be my medium day medium of intensity and reps and then high rep low intensity day like i directly split it up i was thinking basing that off some of the like theories about why daily undulating may be better being because of the like repeated bout effect you're in a bit different stimulus so i was thinking you want to actually change the variables each day to get that bonus effect yeah, and you also add a lot. You said you mentioned like variations in your in your training um, with the exercise selection. Like, how what does that mean to you? Because some people are like really against any variation because you get all the you get all the uh, benefits of bench press by bench pressing. You know what I mean? Like, how do you feel about that? Right. So I guess um, like the least specific I'd get was just dumbbell benching, but I'd also have like a lot more specific stuff, like you know, like spotle presses, long pause. Larson press so basically I have it on like a continuum like most specific stuff would be on the low rep high intensity days and then least specific higher rep uh lower intensity days and yeah I just have basically one or two variations per day I'd start off just some basic given RPE like I usually go for RP four or five to start off the block and I just try and progress it week to week cycle or micro cycle to micro cycle jeez did you within the variation like how did you how did you like assign a protocol for a specific exercise like if you had like um i know how and and i guess how varied would you go per exercise i imagine bench press allows for the most variation just by proxy of the amount of work we can typically handle so do you do you repeat like weeks like um it's like how i write programs is like every I have like a main block, like a development block, and like week one through five is if that's how long they're they're uh, uh, well, it's not really a macro cycle, but if that's how long like their base block lasts, then each week within that block will be the same. Do you kind of have a similar approach? Is every week for you a little bit different? Um, what I usually do is three week micro cycles, and then I'll do like <clears throat> I'll add reps week to week, and then work up a rep range. Like my medium days would be starting week one, four reps, then week two, five, week three, six reps. And I basically reset, add more weight. And then I may make adjustments, like I want to change like whatever variable, but like generally within the micro cycle, I'm just adding the reps and seeing how it goes. And then if I need to make changes between micro cycles, I will generally, I try and avoid it, but yeah. So then do you implement RPE with that adjustment or do you just cross your fingers? Yeah, I start off with RPE, like first micro cycle of a block. And then I plug in weights based on what I hit with RPE. And then I have like plan progression. Like usually I'm trying to add like five pounds. It will depend. Like if I have like a competition closer, I may speed it up adding like 10 pounds micro cycle to micro cycle. But generally like five pounds micro cycle to micro cycle. And then I'm judging based on how the RPEs went if I need to make adjustments, right? Uh, Within the session? Yeah, yeah. Within sessions, I generally, again, I'm using like pretty submax intensity. So usually, I, even on the worst days, I won't have to auto regulate. Like it'll still feel fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I have top singles. I usually use a range, right? I try and hit like around RP8, and I have like my cool range to hit. So that's like basically the only auto regulation I use session to session. Do you use one of those uh, uh, bar speed measures or anything? I do not have one of those. I've been thinking about it though. I know one of my friends who uses it and he's a big fan of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I feel like once you add, add different layers of like objective, uh, objective progress or ob- objective data within the session, it makes it difficult to 
know if you're supposed to believe it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, I mean, bar speed is a good indicator of like your RP, but uh, this kind of leads me to the other question I have about your training is like, have you ever experienced like a major injury before? Yes, I have. Um, it's actually somewhat recently and and near the end of 2020, I had like this upper back injury. It was minor, but it was just kind of like getting worse when I mm -hmm. squat and deadlifted. So I just took two weeks basically off squats and deadlifts, just did some like machine work instead. And my first day back on squats, um, I felt it like it was gone. So I was like, okay, I'll just work up to like a three by two at 495, which is like something like 70% for me. Super easy, right? And on my first rep, I just felt like massive pops in both my knees. And like, I don't know exactly what I did, but it was something with my knees and it was like bad. Then like, yeah, that was, that was the worst injury I ever had. It took me a couple months to rehab it back. How did you, how did you experience that? Like, what was it like for you going through that? So it was actually like really intimidating. Cause I was like thinking like, it basically made like all my squats and deadlifts feel terrible. And it was kind of a slower process rehabbing the injury versus anything else I had before. And I was like wondering, like, will I ever be at back to my old strength or not? Um, it made me really get into like barbell medicine's approach to rehabbing injuries, like the psychological versus just actual structural damage and stuff. I basically like uh, <clears throat> started off like really light volume and just trying to like work it up week to week. Yeah, it was definitely one of the probably the most challenging part of my career so far because you hadn't had a before that like had you had any substantial injuries that slowed you down um not really like i'd had like knee tendonitis but like i could more or less train through that like i was never really at the point like i had to like you know wonder if i could hit even 80 percent of my max on a given day or something like you know it was just like kind of painful day to day and I had like other like minor strains that were like a week or two and then they're better. But this was like different. Yeah, this was like months and months. Jeez. <laughs> I can't believe it only took you a few months to like, because now you're squatting back in the 600s again. You back up yeah. to normal weights. Yeah, pretty much more or less now. It took me, I would say, a few months to get back to 600. I'm trying to remember the exact timeline, but yeah. And what I was basically doing at one point was just like very minimalist volume. Like one day I'd work up to a single and try and like push the threshold of where I can handle the weight and then nothing else. And then the other weight day would just be like a two by two super light pause, like tempo squats, basically take as little stress on tendons as I can. And then, yeah, basically work my way back up with minimalist volume. It worked well. Did you, did you find that you're using more like auto regulative approaches while you're rehabbing? Um, I was actually just doing basic linear progression because like I started off like super light, like I was doing like, once I got like, um, basic strength back, I was doing like 405 for the top single, which was like, I don't even know what percentage that is like 58 or something like that, you know, like super low. And then, yeah, I basically just tried to add a bit of weight week to week, work my way back up. You mentioned that you're trying to like focus more on like how the psychological things impacted pain and the, the experience. Did you like even go to a doctor or anything or a rehab specialist or anything? No, never went to a doctor or anything. I just rehabbed it on my own. And I was basically like, uh, like I said, mainly trying to get over the mental aspect. Like I was like really intimidated going in the squats after that. Cause like when I like had that knee injury happen, I was in like a combo rack, no safeties, no spotters. Right. And I like thought I wasn't going to get it up at all. I managed to grind it up somehow. I don't even know. But yeah, like after that is basically like anytime I went to squats, I sort of like having like that thought in the back of your head. Like what if it happens again? You're just going to like crumple and like really getting over that again. That's why I like the single approach I did basically building that confidence with weights again, week to week, just slowly pushing it. Do you have anyone that you train with or you just pretty much train on your own? I pretty much train alone. There are a lot of powerlifters at my gym, so I guess I like talk to them sometimes. But generally, I'm just like keeping to myself. Yeah, that's crazy. I feel because yeah. I'm not. I guess it's not like crazy, but um, it's. It, it's I would say more so. It's impressive. Impressive because reaching, like getting 
to that point where like <laughs> I guess a better question is like how much ego did you feel like you had with your lifts prior to that moment and I, I'm not assuming that you were like had this massive ego but you know how you can kind of just think in your head like all right I'm killing it you know my squats here my, my numbers are here I'm the second best I have won nationals like things are, th- are thriving and then this injury happens like was there this big disconnect or did you never really have an ego that popped at all no you're definitely right i did have like sort of an ego around my lifting and i think that's can be kind of a good thing like being really confident in yourself it's sort of like creates like positive feedback cycle you think Mm -hmm. you're great you start putting lots of effort into your training you're really hyped to train and then you get better results and it just circles around and works really well but yeah that was a big thing like thinking like what if i never get back to where i was because at that point like and even now like powerlifting was like my whole life like it's my job it's what i study in school it's what like i f- see myself going forward with the rest of my life so it's like you know if i never get back to my where i was like what do i do it's just like i'm kind of lost without it so yeah it was it was a huge part huge part of my ego knowing how much i could lift in that so then did you so that's, I was actually expecting you to say like, oh, I didn't have an ego, I, you know, like I actually was kind of expecting him. Oh, yeah, you know, I <laughs> was really strong, but whatever, um, because like how you're approaching it, like the turnaround time is, I think, a lot quicker than most people when they have a big associate. Like you have, you're a lot, you have a lot invested in your lifting, whether it's like, you know, I'm super confident and also like an asshole, which I don't believe you are. Some people kind of use that in the other direction, but it's more like you are really strong. You are able to make a living off of it. It's something you're really interested and passionate about with like your content creation and stuff. Um, And then your job, like how did you shift mentally from thinking about all those things to, I guess, wherever you're at now? Because you said like, what happens? What, What will happen if you don't get back to your strength level? Like what was the thought that you had in that regard? Right. Um, I think a big part I had to realize is just like, sometimes you just got to focus on what you can control, right? Like, um, you may never get back to your level you were before, but if not, you just got to trust everything's going to be okay. I think that's a big, like a big part of success in any sport. Like I took this class on sports psychology and they went over that, like people who just, um, always trust that things are going to work out no matter what they are like far more successful as athletes. Like they um, tend to do better. And that circles back to the ego thing. That's part of where I got it is from that sports psychology course is like, if you look at elite athletes versus like lower level athletes, the like elite level athletes generally have way higher egos and they're way, they perform a lot better when they have high levels of like self efficacy and self esteem. They believe in themselves a lot. So that's why I was trying to have before is basically like, always trust in myself, believe I can be the best and that. Is that something that you like currently aspire to be like best in the world? Is that a big goal of yours? Yeah, I feel like that's always the goal, but it's like, understand like that's incredibly lofty, even if you don't get it, like whatever. But like, yeah, even when I like first started lifting, like I was always like weak kids, small, unathletic, like I was never a good athlete. But even when I was like first starting lifting, I'm doing like one plate on squats. I never doubted I could get to like a really elite level, which back then would have sound laughable. But like I credit that mindset to like being a big reason why I got as far as I did is because like I never doubted I could be better than other people or that I could get really high level. That's so interesting because usually people that feel that way also have like a reference point for like another sport or something, you know, they move from like football to, to lifting or they have like a, a reference point. Like why w- did you ever feel like that way with other sports? Like, Hey, I'm going to be better than you at football or I don't know, hockey, I guess in Canada. Right. Yeah. I used to play hockey a bit as a kid and like, I want, I never really like, I'd always like have the dream of like being like NHL player or like superstar, but like, I never, I don't think I ever really believed it. I don't know what was different with lifting though, but I was like, I believe like if I put the effort in, like I really can be the best at this. I don't know where it came from, but maybe it didn't come from something specific, but just the mindset led to it actually becoming that outcome. Did did you have any like inspirations for powerlifting when you start? And also how long ago did you start lifting? 
So I started at summer of 2014 and like, I didn't know anything about actual powerlifting. Really. I basically read a bodybuilding.com forum of a beginner lifting program and it was starting strength. And that's what got me into lifting. And like, I knew nothing about powerlifting for like a year and a half until my other friend in high school, he got into actual powerlifting and he's like telling me about like the IPF and stuff. And like, I, I literally knew basically nothing uh, around that point. I like the only powerlifter, if you asked me who a powerlifter was, I would have said like Omar Esau, like that's all I knew. <laughs> yeah. Like I know nothing about actual competing. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually how I kind of got into powerlifting too, is like bodybuilding.com ironically. And like just the starting strength thread, there's a bunch of them, but like every week is just a new person. Like, Hey, how much, how much should I be able to add to my squat? You know, if I, I've been doing this for eight weeks, like I only got this strong. And then some guy would come in there like, you got to eat more pussy or something. And they're just like, like yeah. uh, yelling at them to eat, eat more food. Yeah. I remember I was doing like some, uh, I think starting strength is like a blessing and a curse with that. Like it's got some, I think for people who are in my shoes, like no real lifting experience, like it's a good basis. But like I was doing some stupid stuff, man. Like I started adding in accessories and I do like a three by five on curls. Singing so like I got to be the only person ever doing sets of five on curls. <laughs> it definitely teaches you to like grind though. I mean, like it can, it can, it depends where you're coming from and who's teaching you. But like uh, I, I ran it for maybe a year or two and I just always hit a wall and I never really understood like, so I've kind of a different experience from, from you, I think, cause I, I would try a linearly progressing and it seemed like it only would work for a few weeks. And then I'd just get really fatigued or tired or, you know, burnt out or my body was like, I got injured really early. I had like, remember I started deadlifting and trying to learn how to do sumo and conventional. And like I had early on back pain from, <clears throat> from deadlifting. And I like had a very like, trial and get hurt and error type of thing it wasn't like i'm not getting stronger it's just like i'll push myself get hurt i'm 16 damn it am I, did i just stunt my growth you know and I like have to constantly reconnect with like okay maybe i'm fine but how do i get better like did you early on did you kind of have with that linear progression <laughs> excuse me um kind of a better response right yeah like in three months of starting strength i got to like 315 on squats and deadlifts and 175 on bench which considering like i was starting at like a plate for set of five once i learned basic form on squats and deadlifts, that was pretty good progress but like i kept on it and then i remember six months later i tried to test my maxes again and i only added 10 pounds on my squat and that was it like bench and deadlift stagnated so that's the point i started experimenting other programming yeah that's awesome. I, I envied uh, the people who could get to 315 in like three months because it took me maybe two years to get to 315 myself. And I'm just like, huh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'll be the best in the world at this because this guy on the thread that I was just on is like 15 and he's already at 405. Um, <laughs> so but did you have like anyone that taught you how to like do the movements properly or like how did you learn that? Um, not really. Like basically I watched like Alan Thrall's basic tutorials on YouTube to get the basics down. And then from there it was basically mainly trial and error for the most part. Like I was basically in a vacuum. Like I didn't really consume much content. I didn't know like about, I didn't really know anybody who lifted much. I basically just went to like my local community gym and this was like, not like a serious gym at all. Like I was the strongest person there when I could squat two plates. It's mainly like oh. seniors and stuff that go to this gym. Yeah. So like, yeah, I was basically learning on my own. I think that's kind of a good way to learn form. I feel like a lot of things with form are really like individualistic and it's sort of like like a dynamic system approach. Like what's efficient will naturally arise by doing what feels good. That's it's like the polar opposite of how <laughs> how I I learned because I was like always wondering like am I doing this right how does it look how does it, I, I would record my own lifts and I'd send them back to the same forum where everyone else is stronger than me but <clears throat> I was actually able to make a few pretty cool friends from the bodybuilding.com forums I one of my buddies I meet up with like every year and he was the one person where I felt like he wasn't trying to like make me feel bad about my technique he just kind of helped me out we both didn't really know what we were doing but um 
Yeah, it's like the inverse of I was very much trying to figure out whether or not what I was doing looked good because it didn't feel good. <laughs> um, especially once I started low bar and I was like, did you ever have that uh, kind of brain aneurysm when it came to trying to figure out to squat high bar or low bar when you first started out? No, I basically went straight to low bar and it felt like felt good right away. So I was like, I'm just going to stick with this. And I think the lost starting strength guys are all like, low bar is the way to go. You got to use your hip drive and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. The people who were low, uh, low bar feels good are like, they start the funnel of starting strength. And if they go too deep, it's hard to get out. Were you able to like, when, when did you start deviating from, from like a controlled program? And I saw on your YouTube video that you kind of recommend uh, Candido's like six week, I think six week program or uh, actually I, I forget the other one that you recommended for people to start. Yeah. I think I said uh, Candido six week as like a good intermediate. And I think I said Shiko. I honestly forget what I put oh, in right. my program, but yeah, yeah. I think Shiko and me have a lot of similarities, like focusing on volume over other variables. But yeah, after like a year of training, that's when I started to like really branch out into like trying my own stuff. Like first I tried ultra high frequency as like squatting and benching six days a week, deadlifting once and then just trying out. Yeah. Basically a bunch of different programs like that, seeing what worked and what didn't. She goes, I mean, it seems like you actually draw a lot of inspiration from, from she goes programs, but like, <laughs> which one of the things if people don't know, like she goes programs were just like a pro from what I understand, it's like a program in one of his books for one of his lifters that people would extract from the book and then turn into like well they didn't turn into it there's like this is his program and it's like program 36 or something in a book that he wrote um but it still gives a good idea of like a how he programs in general right yeah yeah i think his general training philosophy is basically um yeah similar to mine lower intensity higher volume i remember i used to go on reddit's powerlifting forum a lot and you see a lot of people commenting about Shiko. He was really popular, his programming there. And people would comment like they feel like they're not like um they're not strong because they're doing such low intensity for so long. And then they test out their maxes and they realize they got good progress. And yeah, mm. I think we got a lot of overlap between our philosophies there. How does that uh philosophy overlap um apply to like clients that you work with? Right. So I would say a lot of people I coach, like I give them the questionnaire that goes over their training background. A lot of them, they don't do that at all. So like, I also ask them like what worked for you and what didn't. And a lot of times what worked for them is different from mine. So I try and like, I want to do what worked for them in the past, like basically recreate it. But I also have my general training philosophy. Like I want to focus on volume, generally higher frequency, as long as you can still recover and lower intensity. So I try and like, get a middle ground between the two and when somebody's just kind of done whatever they don't have anything specific then i give them my training style and it tends to work well i find that it only works for certain people though. like some people are just like they don't handle volume well at all they get injured really quickly and i gotta make a bit different training programs for them but like some people who i've like i've got a couple clients that specifically mention like higher frequency and higher volume work for them and then when i give them my programming they just like blew up really quickly like i had one guy post on my story this past week we've been working together for 17 months i think and we've gone from like a 480 pound squat to we just hit 300 kilos this past week so yeah like Damn, for some man. people it's for some people the style really works but for others it's it doesn't so it's just finding that compromise between my philosophies and what's worked for them and trying to find a compromise middle ground between the two do you find that you struggle with lifters that have like a different training philosophy like like because i personally have a difficult time writing programs it's, it's not like it's hard to write it it's that i feel like sometimes my i'm not aware that i'm being biased with the decision until like oh hey yeah that really didn't work for you okay <laughs> all right and i like take off my brain and then i like empty it <laughs> and then i'm like all right <laughs> wait I don't know you, you don't know me. So let's start again. What do you need to do? You know what I mean? Like there's this like pivot point where, okay, my initial thoughts about you and, and everything you told me and how I interpreted that was wrong. So we got to do something new. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Like I've had times where I give them their program 
and then just like straight away they just instantly like it's not working they're having bad sessions they're feeling they're feeling beat up they're not recovering and stuff and i'm just like yeah this is like not working we gotta we gotta re rethink how we're doing this and oftentimes it's when i'm not focusing on what worked for them it's when i'm focusing on what's worked for me and people i've coached i gotta remember you know i gotta do what works for the individual not what works for the general as a general trend mm -hmm. i find that so difficult i mean it's, it's actually not it's difficult but it's also really empowering when like you work with someone that doesn't respond to what you think that they will and that's when like the creative problem solving really happens because like until that point you're being validated effectively for your first thought <laughs> that you had you know and if it works you're like sweet uh, let's keep doing that and then if it doesn't it's like oh crap because <laughs> you, you kind of have confidence with your decisions when you're writing a program usually I, I probably have a relatively high amount of confidence when i write my first program with everyone and then all of that confidence falls on its face when hey, I'm, I feel like shit or like they get injured or, or they just not making progress. And then it's like, all right, go time. Let's figure out what's going on. Cause we have probably one or two blocks more until you decide that you don't want to work with me anymore. You know what I mean? What happens in your mind? Like when someone comes to you after a block and it just doesn't, doesn't work out. Like, do you get anxious? Do you feel calm? And then what do you do with the creative problem solving piece? Right. Usually I feel guilty. Cause like, even when I first started coaching, I still do it now as I like offer, like, if you don't make progress, I'll give you a full refund. Cause like, and I don't say it for their benefit. It's more for my benefit. Like, I'm going to feel bad if I didn't give you progress. Like, I feel like that's my job. I feel like I owe it to you. So like, yeah, I usually feel guilty. Like I'm emotionally tied into like their progress as well. So I usually, yeah, I try and <clears throat> the other problem with that is like when the whole program doesn't work at all, you think you got to make like these monumentous changes, but, and like change everything. But then again, if you change everything, like how do you know what changes you made were actually benefiting them or how do you like, you get, you want to only change a bit at a time to be able to tell what was actually not working versus working and whatnot. So, yeah. I find that like communicating that process is, is helpful for some lifters like for example some lifters are that our coaches typically are, are a lot more bought into like oh yeah I, it's going to take some time to figure out what works um i actually don't get really allow myself to work with people that are ready for like the quick fix of programming within a month or whatever like it not to be an ass but my prices are kind of too high for someone to think that they're going to get a quick fix right away like like they're going to get a good quality experience but it's like processes up, up front you know it's like working with a therapist like I, I don't expect the first time i speak to a therapist i'm gonna have all my life changes you know uh required to make me feel better um but there's been times especially when i was working with rts where like i was i would work with like luke richardson for example and i worked with him for three years and he got wicked strong and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, it's almost like a burden. Like, um, cause now lifters that have are nothing like him or aspire to be like him are kind of expecting to get as strong as he is or he did. Do you have kind of experiences like that too, where someone's like, Hey, I saw you got this guy crazy strong, you know, I'm ready for that too. And then their expectations kind of, uh, are misaligned with like what is actually required yeah absolutely like i got like a couple guys who i've put like a few hundred pounds on their total like even in within a year and then other people see that and they want that and like it's not only just like that's a huge outlier it may not happen for everybody even if you put in the same effort the other thing i get is a lot of people don't put in the same effort as everybody else like it's not as big like these guys who make hundreds of pounds of progress like powerlifting is basically their life you know i think you get like a lot more clients like that who are really serious about powerlifting I think it's just like the difference between the mediums like YouTube, I think versus like the Instagram powerlifting community. It's a lot more casual. Like I get a lot more casual coaching inquiries where it's guys who are just like basically they're gym rats. Like, you know, they go a couple of days a week, but they're not like, you know, skipping, going out with friends and stuff to make sure they get their eight hours and hit their macros and whatnot. Wait, did you say that people on YouTube are more casual or people on Instagram are more casual? People on YouTube, I think they're generally a more casual crowd. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, I, I really enjoy working with, with, uh, the casual crowd too, because like there's a level of expectation, like their expectations almost like mismatched in, a, in the other way. Like I find that casual lifters don't have that positive feedback loop that like someone that wants to be number one, you know, or, or just to go to nationals or something They they already have created a lifestyle for themselves. And now the only like missing ingredient for them is like the program or that's what they think. Whereas with the casual lifters, it's like they can make a few adjustments here with their lifestyle um, or not. They get a good relationship with a the coach. They have a good program. They learn a few technical things that they haven't thought about for a few years. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, this maybe we should get you a belt <laughs> or something. Or like, you know, hey, uh, that's crazy that you've been able to train at this commercial gym for five years. But <laughs> what? Do you want to go, you know, do you want to go to a, a powerlifting gym? Like you might have better equipment and they're like, wow, it made a big difference. And like, I find that really enjoyable too. Um, but what you said about like the, the lifters who are getting really strong really quickly, like I want to go back to Luke, not to talk about him specifically, but like he and a few of the other lifters that I worked with as a result, powerlifting was like literally their life. You know, there's nothing they wouldn't do to get stronger. I mean, other than drugs, to be honest. Um, but like if drugs were legal in their federation, I'm sure they wouldn't have any issue with it. Um, but it's like they'll sleep eight hours, maybe 10 hours. A lot of them are to sleep like 10 hours a night getting like they're constantly getting their protein in. Uh, Luke had like a r rigid approach to his hot and cold showers, um, which I didn't know if there's a lot of evidence for, but he did it and it was working. So he kept doing it. Um, just really like routine oriented people to be, uh, to, yeah, observationally, that seems to be what happens when lifters are just getting wicked strong. It's like, they'll do everything that they need to period. Right. Do you yeah. find that you have that with yourself and others? Yeah. And then sometimes like, like I think especially myself, like I'm somebody who's taking powerlifting super seriously. And sometimes things that I just think are like a given, like other people don't give it like they'll be like i'll like talk to them and they'll be like oh by the way i've been doing like half my work beltless when i like didn't say anything about beltless work at all and like mm -hmm. i don't really or like stuff like they're like oh yeah like i i usually get like 50 grams of protein per day is that enough and stuff like that like to me it's just like a given like i don't need even need to think like no that's not nearly enough protein no you should be using your belt stuff like that yeah <laughs> And then all, sometimes it's like uh, some of the lifters you work you work with that are really strong and really into it. Sometimes it's almost, it's almost hard to know what to focus on. It's like, well, you already covered the bases. You've already they already know all of the general things you go over with most of your lifters. It and it almost can feel like you. From for me, what I've realized is a lot of times it's a psychological work that we have to emphasize um especially if they're not like if they're really dedicated they have a lot of the lifestyle things improving but they're not making progress it's like okay how are you relating to your training and how can we use the information to make the program work more for you because you're already doing everything that you can to work for the program you know what i mean right yeah um i would say there's almost like an inverse relationship between how high level the person is and how much feedback you give them like the top level people like you know usually their forms all down they're already like i have i asked them about like their sleep and nutrition and stuff and they're usually all on top of that so it's almost like i don't really have much to tell you versus like the really inexperienced people you know their stuff like they, their sleep schedule is terrible so i'm like telling them the importance of like sleep hygiene and sleeping the right amount and then like their squat form is like, I got to go over like even really basic stuff again. So I'm like writing them like paragraphs of things to try <laughs> versus like the top guy. I almost feel bad. It's like, okay, you're making all this progress. You're so strong, but like, I don't really have much to give you anymore. Like you're pretty much on point. I just got to plug in your progression and that's it. I find the most anxious, like part of coaching a, a high level lifter is the kind of meat, meat prep, like it's like don't get them injured mostly like that my, in my head it's like especially especially when they've decided powerlifting is their life it's like okay shit now like we really what happens when this kid gets injured or this adult gets injured you know like 
they've already committed. You know, it's like with you. It's like you had your knee pain, uh, a knee injury or however you want to describe it. Like you had a really good response to that from just what I'm hearing. <laughs> but I don't know that everyone's going to have that response to like a big injury, you know? Right. Yeah, that too. Um, you know, I got like some people I coached, they're like, they've got grandkids even like, you know, lifting is just like a little thing they do on the side. So like when you've got like somebody, you really invest in their, like their lifting is basically their whole life. You really got to like, you really get a feeling that like, I've got to nail this or like, I'm letting them down a lot. Like I'm like directly hurting them. And then like, like you said, like the meat prep thing the big is the big part. Especially because I find like that's the thing in programming that probably is the most variation from person to person is how exactly they need to peak, like what they what works well for them. Like I've had mm-hmm. really high level clients where I try like what I think will be a good peak for them and it just goes terribly. And then we got to like refine the process and then we finally figure out something that works. Have you have you heard of my story that I talked about one time with um Ben, one of my lifters, Ben Wharton? Okay, so for those of you listening, I don't I don't coach Ben Wharton anymore, but he's a really strong British lifter. And um we first started working together in like 20 2018, I think. No, 2019. Yeah, uh March February 2019. Oh no, he he started working with me 2018 November, but it's pretty much 2019. And uh he had worlds to prepare for. We had a few inter- uh, intermittent competitions. I think he had British nationals that October. And um, I hadn't really bought into emerging strategies or like bottom up training, which is what I was implementing with RTS. I like, I believed in the idea that everyone has this, you know, protocols that work for them, but I just thought maybe it's just the idea that they're doing the same thing every week that it needs to be kind of adjusted, but, we still want to graduate towards higher intensities as they get closer to the competition one way or another, you know, just some linear progression with the, the, the protocols will be fine. And we kind of did that for his British competition, but then for world's prep, which is the one he really cared about, I was like banking on it to help him. And, uh, we started with like, you know, I think fours, and block one and then like triples and block two and then doubles and block three and then like singles and doubles and block and this last block leading up to the competition and like his best block was like the first block and i'm like okay well maybe the estimate of where max is dropping as he gets closer because he's going from fours to three so he's getting like maybe the fours are just like inflated so i'm not really worrying about it and then we get closer and closer and like it just kind of keeps going like the, you know downwards and I'm like it's like three weeks out and I'm like, okay, this really isn't what I expected to happen. You know, we didn't change any of the stress. The total volume is the same. The intensities are really the only thing that are increasing. And he keeps telling me, you know, things are kind of feeling rough today, but I'm, you know, I believe in it. I trust the process. I'm good to go. And like, I'm like, yeah, I trust the process too. And then we get to the, to worlds and like, we both trust the process and it just flat fell on its face. Like he had his worst meat since you know uh not working with me but it was a similar like he hit prs but it was like not the prs we're expecting like he was estimated maxes were like 20 30 40 kilos above um what he hit at meet day like the previously in the year and that was probably the moment where i was like okay there's something about programming that is a lot more than just like (laughs) Like you can't hand wave your way into a meet. You know what I mean? Like you, you, there are real consequences for getting the wrong protocols in a, in a lifter's program for a long time, even if they're not getting hurt. Like we, I, I, there's not a lot of models I can just follow and then like trust on their own without, without the data really following suit. And both him and I were sitting there kind of like tearing up, to be honest, because we're just like, oh shit, man, that was... It's a bad meet, you know, in its worlds and like, it's all he wanted. And I was like, all right, I need to turn this around for this guy because he believes in me. I believe in myself. I don't want to like quit. Like, should I quit my job? That was horrible. You know what I mean? And so 
kind of took that data and I was like, all right, so the fours you responded well to, but I, in my head, I didn't know, does that mean you're going to have a good single attempt or is it again, is it inflated estimated maxes? So we had a few blocks like back to back, whereas like top set was like a four at an eight, four, four and five at an eight. And then we tested them in like a mock meet. So I was like, all right, we're going to do fours for four weeks. And then at the end of the fourth week, we're going to test your maxes and just see what the difference is. And it's like, okay. And then we had the meet mock me and he, uh, he hit like all time PRs, like in the first block back from worlds. I was like, all right. So there's something to this like middle, middle rep range that is unique to him. And kind of what we found out was that the higher intensities were so psychologically taxing for him that it was really difficult to sustain for any period of time. Like anytime we do like one week of singles or something, it was good, but sustained weeks of like singles, doubles, triples, RP8, RP9, just way too much for him. And so ironic, I, I guess kind of uh, coincidentally, we ended up approaching it with much more of like a, a Chico-esque um, training approach. And like, that's just so not how I program for most people. Uh, low RPEs, sixes, sevens at RP, seven, eight, uh, just really not getting a lot of high reps in uh, or low, low rep range training in. And like, that just seemed to be one of the more uh, apparent reasons for paying attention to the the individual differences because uh, decisions have consequences and like the protocols that you choose to stick with for a whole block if a lifter cares a lot about it you are responsible for that that decision with them you know and it can be really scary have you ever had an experience like that yeah it actually made me think exactly like i had this one client and he was doing like high rep deadlifts before. Like normally I would never have like a competition deadlift above like six reps. If I was going up like above that, I'd do something like a stiff legged deadlift or even like dumbbell stiff legged, you know, try mm -hmm. and make it a bit less fatiguing a variation. And then he, after each cycle, I usually ask like feedback, like, what do you want to try? Is there anything like thought specific? He said, I want to try high rep deadlifts again. And I was a bit wary about it because I was like, okay, this usually like doesn't go well, but he's really insistent. So I'll try it. And we did like sets of seven to nine reps on deadlifts. And like, we've been doing it since. And like our deadlift progress has been like outpacing all our other lifts. Like it's just blown up completely. And I just like, yeah, sometimes your, your theory isn't going to match up with what you actually see. You got to focus on what actually works for the person. Like, and even hearing that, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, like how, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. And, I, yeah. I, and I've like literally experienced it with lifters too. I'm still like... But why? <laughs> like, Yeah. And like, he's not like, normally if that was to work for somebody, it'd be somebody who isn't very strong, right? Like they're, but he's like pulling like his max now is about like 650 and he's a 93 lifter. Mm -hmm. So like he's the, he's strong. It's not like he's, he's somebody whose maximal strength is like still not fatiguing like a beginner. Like he's somebody who on paper, you would think like this is not going to work. And it's not like I'm doing limited sets either. I'm doing like the normal amount of sets, but just higher rep ranges. But yeah, it works out. So, you know, you got to focus on the outcome rather than the theory. Yeah. And speaking of that, I think the the pandemic for a lot of lifters has been like really challenging those like narratives in terms of like, okay, here's what is optimal. And so like, I mean, because a lot of lifters don't have the ability to train optimally when they're like lifting in their kitchens. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have you had to make modifications in the last few years because of that? Or like how, how have you experienced that as a coach? Yeah, I've had like a, quite a few people that are training in the home gyms with really limited equipment. Um, typically on like, uh, was it like bench work and specifically I'll do like lots of like non-barbell variations like i'll do like dumbbell pressing i'll do lots of like machine work for isolation and then like when covid hit like at least half my client base like had to like go back to like a basic home gym where they have a barbell and maybe a rack and nothing else like they don't have dumbbells they don't have like even an adjustable bench they don't have machines so i had to like rethink a lot of like training things like how am i gonna get this isolation work in and like i've had people like doing like like I'd have people doing like split squats or whatever or leg press. I'm like, okay, how am I going to make like hypertrophy variations, but not have it be too much squat volume where they feel overworked and stuff like that. So yeah, it's basically changing a lot of like the like things I would just think of basic program design. Like 
I'm not going to have you do like all your hypertrophy work on barbell back squats because that's going to be too fatiguing. And yeah, having to rethink, like get creative. That was the best part of uh, it's the one silver bullet, I guess, or silver lining in um, in the pandemic was like it really was another one of those moments where I realized that everything I thought wasn't necessarily the case. Like I had another lifter where he only could do split squats in his garden and like split squats and like dumbbell overhead press and like there's no barbell. So what have we got? What can we do to like keep muscle on him so that if he comes back to the gym, you know, he'll be okay. And um, we had already been working together, I think at that point for like two and a half years. And so he, for like four or five months, he had no access to a gym. We just like high rep split squats, variations and push-ups and stuff like that. All the things you can think of, I guess. And uh, we came back to the gym once they opened up again. And he's like, hey, you know, I haven't really tried to create a custom RPE table. So do you think maybe now is a good time to do that? And I was like, yeah, actually, let's go ahead and do it. Like, screw it. So to do that, you need to have you need to test your like one rep max, like your four rep max, eight rep max. And if you really want to, you could do like a 12 rep max, but basically you need to have enough space in between those days to, to test them. So you can reference the differences in RPE and percentages. Um, and like, so he does his max testing for his squat bench and deadlift after literally just doing pushups and, and split squats. And, uh, uh, we also did, uh, sprinting on a bike because he could bike outside, which is kind of tight. So he was able to cycle. Um, and he comes back and hits like a 10 kilo squat PR after not training for five months with a barbell and hadn't hit a PR on squat for like a year before COVID started. And I was like, wow. Okay. Well, again, um, should I quit my job? Like what, what was I doing before? Like, cause I kept, I think, I think we kept hitting them with stuff. You know, but it's all just like the wrong things. Like there's like a little bubble of stuff we were working with and trying to experiment within that bubble. And then it popped, you know, COVID happened. We had to switch around to this other bubble. And I'm like, how about we bring some of that stuff over here? So like effectively what we learned was you can get a lot of strength retention, if not gain strength, at least this lifter could with like high rep, uh, low specificity exercises. So that's kind of what we imp implemented for, um, for the next training blocks like we did one comp squat and then like a lot of his volume would come from uh le leg press and split squats and progress happened again all of a sudden like almost magically um except for it wasn't magic it was data but it was surprising data you know do you have any like crazy things happen like that <laughs> yeah i never had anything to that extent i was like listening to that story and i was not thinking he's gonna hit a pr i was just thinking he'd still be like relatively strong because like he didn't even do like like a dumbbell split squat even is like or split squat is like not even that similar to squad specificity it's just basically still working quads but like yeah, yeah. i never had something that extreme but yeah i think that general principle of just you gotta find out what works for each person you know stuff that stuff that works for you isn't isn't gonna work for everybody have you found that like motivation for your lifters has has kind of undulated as well like do you have a lot more like psychological conversations with your clients? Yeah, I've started to realize that a lot is like, it's basically one of the biggest like associations between people is how well they, how good their like self-esteem and like belief is. Like I had one guy who hired me as a coach and like before we even started, before I'd even sent my questionnaire, he's asked me these questions like, I'm in grad school. I don't think I can make progress. And he's like, I haven't made progress in a year. He's like, are you going to be able to, are you actually going to refund me if I don't make progress? And it's like, you're already like starting off right off the bat thinking this isn't going to work. Like versus like the people who've made the most progress, they like never even like nothing phases them. Like even if they have a bad day, they're like, oh, whatever. And mm -hmm. then like next day they're fine. So yeah, I started to realize how important it is and not even just for like performance, but also pain as well. Like all of people who like, every little like feeling they get they'll like ask me if this is an injury where it's like if i'm lifting and i just feel like a little twinge in my muscle i'm not even going to give it a second thought i'm just like okay that's that is what it is and then it goes away the next rep don't even worry but they're like thinking like oh should we deload it may like it may like get aggravated and i'm like 
I'm realizing how much that psychological link to performance really is. Like it's not just it's not just physiological. You gotta think both aspects. Yeah, I mean, even in my own training, it's like and I made a few posts on like the like science of motivation, because I I got really sick of people saying that like motivation is is fleeting or like this is like temporary thing. Because it's like if you really look into the literature on like what motivation is and, and fundamentally it's like the reason for us to 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 participate and engage in a behavior and depending on how much motivation you have for a thing will it dictate whether or not you continue participating in that behavior like whether you've been doing it as a habit or not like at some point habits aren't habits anymore you know and so like creating a, a ritual or routine can help increase the like relatedness for example like with powerlifting the more you start to power lift, it's not just the fact that you're doing it a lot, but it's also typically the people that are like sticking with it um, also have found somewhat of a community or they've found like ways to connect with it that is not just like the action of lifting. You know what I mean? Um, whether it's joining a gym or just having like that space for themselves where it's like they can be mindful and that's something that they really enjoy or they finally get away from their family because their family is always yelling all the time. You know, whatever it is, it's like, it's not, it's not like you do this thing. Um, like, I don't know. Discipline is, is a thing for sure, but it's also what people get wrong about di di discipline and motivation is that discipline actually is a motivator. <laughs> so like being disciplined is a way in which people are motivated. And, um, I have a, I had a lot of lifters that are just struggling a lot with meets uh, being canceled so much the last few years, um, whether it's because of COVID or now because like USAPL and uh, IPF like dissolved each other, separated, right? And not all of my lifters are gung ho about either one. They just want to compete, you know, and they want to have fun. And a lot of them wanted to compete uh, at Worlds. How have you kind of experienced that for yourself as a lifter and in, 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 in the CPU? Like, does that imp how USAPL leaving the IPF impact like what you want to do within powerlifting yourself? Yeah, so I think like a big reason like a lot of people like I I would say like my peers in powerlifting are like unusually like they're more at the higher level, you know, like people going to worlds or like going to be placing first at nationals or whatever. Mm -hmm. like a big thing for them is they want to be where the best of the best is so like the usapl leaving is like a big thing because if you look like the usapl national champion is basically more or less going to be close to if not the strongest person in the world in ipf so like yeah a lot of them they want to the usapl leaving even though it's canada like it still affects them like now usapl is going to introduce like they're going to have their own international meets and then people are deciding which one they want to go in you know, you can't do both. Wait, so have they talked about international meets? Because I saw they joined up with Australia. Yeah, I'm not sure how much if this is public or if I'm just releasing the info I've just heard from <laughs> insiders. But but um, yeah, basically, the way I see it is they're going to allow top level lifters from wherever if they have hit like a certain weight and meet, they're going to have international events you can go in. So the USAPL will continue to have its own nationals. That's just like USAPL people, Americans. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to allow you know, like top lifters from overseas to compete at a, their own international events head to head, and then they can earn money and they got like their pro card system. I don't know exactly how it works, but basically the highest level lifters get pro cards in that. Wow. Yeah. I, and if you're also at the top of your federation and like you're kind of questioning which one is the move, I mean, what is, what is inspiring for you? Like you want to be the best in the world, but then like USA has a lot of the top lifters, but like, arguably still at the worlds like in your weight class especially international competition isn't bad you know like what do you have a meal norling in your weight class yeah so I, I was in i'm trying to move up to 105 but like basically the way it's working out is i'm probably only going to be able to apply for 93 for a world spot so i'll probably have to go back down but yeah so like either 93 or 105 like they've got competition internationally as well like 93 they got like a Gustav Hedlund. And then like if you go to 105, there's like Anatoly from Ukraine and yeah, Emil Norling, like you said. Corrent as well on the one. Yeah, Corrent from France. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely international competition. But there's also like um if the USAPL starts 
drawing in that national international competition, especially if they start offering more money, you know, people are going to want to be where the most competition is. I think it's like when Strongman had that split in the two thousands between the world's strongest man and I forget the other one. But yeah, yeah. I don't know how. I don't know as much about Strongman, but yeah, it's it's. I mean, they even did it within powerlifting when they tried to do the money meets. Um, I don't know if it's like WRPF, but it was like this kind of similar to what USAPL is doing. It was like super spectacular lifting. They had like girls in bikinis walking around and like trying to make it the WWE, but for powerlifting. And there's like fire everywhere and stuff. And I think they had it at the Arnold a few times. And I think the winner would get like 20 grand or something. Uh, but it, it, it dissolved because like they spent all their money from like venture capitalists, like people were just giving them money for that. Like it wasn't exactly sustainable, especially with like the popularity of powerlifting at the time. It To me, it seems like USAPL is trying to do something like that slash turning it into like CrossFit, like not turning it into CrossFit, but going the CrossFit route of like, hey, let's just get business sponsors and then we can fund it and make it worldwide. Like that's my take at least is, and I know they care about international competition, but they definitely seem to be a lot more interested in making it like a spectacle or, or viewable if some as some people might think. Yeah, I think that's going to be the big thing is getting that corporate money. And I think that would be what would really get the things going is like having the top level athletes actually make money. Like, for example, like me going the world's cost me like several thousand dollars, right? Like. Mm-hmm it's like not sustainable really if you're going to have like you're you're not going to draw talent in if they're paying money to compete at the highest level you want to be paying them so like that's why i think the usapl they might actually like i don't know how it's going to play out but they could like overtake ipf if ipf doesn't start like offering money as well i guess it could be good for powerlifting i know a lot of people say we need like unity but also if you have competition where people they're each trying to get better products the people could end up being that benefit for the lifters yeah, I think the people that will suffer, though, is like, as always, the people that have less resources in their, like, home countries, you know, and like, okay, now we got to fund not only the competition, but now the lifters and, like, it's not a lot of profit at competitions anyway, so you got to then have, like, these countries that don't have resources that need to find, like, some corporate sponsor so they can pay to have their lifters go to the meet or, or whatever, however it works out, like, and, and, you know, to be fair, like it, it's, it's probably going to be a long time until those countries have a lot of competition, but I think that just kind of sucks because there's always lifters. Like one of the things I like about powerlifting is that it's really accessible and I'm not necessarily saying that USAPL doing what they're doing makes it less accessible, but it could, it definitely like sets the stage like this. We're going, we're going this way and they're going that way. And so it's like just the split itself, I think can make it more difficult to get into it. Um, yeah, you know what I mean? Like the division might be helpful in the long run, might not be, but especially now with COVID happening at the same time, I feel like it really sucks personally. <laughs> right, yeah. That's a good point about like the lower level people are going to be the ones suffering. I remember, I forget where the discussion was, but it was somebody asking about where IPF is getting all like they're getting all this money where is it going and then like this IPF executive broke it down and they were like spending tons to get like powerlifting equipment to lower income countries so they could host meets you know they're buying them combo racks and bars and plates and yeah it's not gonna that's a definitely a downside if IPF lose popularity you know they are growing the sport a lot in some smaller countries yeah because they were invested in like the, yeah the smaller comp- companies having equipment and stuff like is that not what they're doing anymore is that like part of the thing why i think it's just if they're gonna start offering money from uh for big level athletes as well you know the money's got to come from somewhere it's obviously gonna hurt the bottom line somewhere yeah yeah i mean that's kind of what i i don't know it's not gonna impact me directly but it it does suck um i had an online meet in october with his out strength and it was it was really cool because like i know i didn't really knew, know who was going to sign up 
And it was mostly a bunch of lifters from Egypt and then a few from Germany and then a few of my clients uh, participated as well. And like the guys from Germany were taking it or, or from Egypt, you know, they don't have a lot of competition. So they were taking it really seriously. You know, it was like five guys in uh, two different gyms and they're all friends and like, it was like a mock me, but like, they're really into it, you know? And, um, it's like that, that is so cool that even though this isn't like officiated at, at, at the time, like they got like three different angles with their cameras. They're all like hyping each other up. They're making sure the cameras like, so I can see, cause I'll be judging it while, while watching. And I don't know. I, I mean, that was one of my, what I thought would have been a cooler solution. I, I felt like the timing of all of this was just really bad. Cause I think a lot of lifters were already struggling with their motivation with lifting. And then it's like, now I got to decide who to compete with. And, um, what does that mean for like the longevity of the sport? And like, do I even want to be involved in all of the drama? Because like not every lifter is 22 trying to start lifting. Like I got lifters that are 45, you know, you said that you do too. It's like, sometimes you got people that just want it to stay how it is so they can like plan for it you know what i mean right yeah it does really disrupt things a lot i was thinking about like the country like you said egypt like they didn't have mm -hmm. really like meets there to compete in there's lots of like talent in those countries that we might not know about because they can't compete mm -hmm. like even like rondell hunt like he went to worlds and won the world championship in calgary and like he's like arguably the best person in his weight class and then his home country's federation is like a mess. There's a ton of drama, so he can't compete. And now he hasn't like been able to actually get to the world stage and compete internationally, which again would be like huge for the sport. Having somebody like him who's like totally in like over 2000 in the 105 class, just insane, right? Isn't he at Trinidad? Isn't he from yeah, Trinidad? yeah. And then I think there was something like the people who run the Trinidad Federation or there's like some political power grab in the federation and something like that yeah 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 it's a bummer but i mean yeah i know it just is like that's just it like it just is it sucks and i i take jabs at the usapl all the time because like i think that their social media is like kind of hilariously run um but at the same time like it's really difficult to build a f an organization um where everyone can like compete and agree on things and like no one's ever going to be like completely on board um this also kind of nostalgic though because like uh when an, like international competition if you haven't been to them when the usapl and australia and like all of the european nations all come together to like lift it like some random country it was Bel Belarus was like the last time Australia could compete in the USAPL or sorry in the IPF and like it's like the last time where lifters from around the world were able to kind of compete together. So like the more the fracturing, the more the nostalgic of like it was all together at one point. That was so cool. But but uh, yeah, I, I definitely see the value there. It's so like right now with lifting is how it is. Like what's your approach for lifting um, for yourself? Right. So like I'm just now becoming an open lifter this year 2022 right so i think for before that i was really focused a lot more on the short term like i want to try to be number one in the world as a junior before my junior career is over right and then i ended up getting second and then like but now that i'm shifting to open you know it's a bigger gap in competition between second and first so now i'm just starting to think a lot more long term right like maybe not necessarily i want to get first as quick as possible but like i want to get I want to be the most likely position. I'll be first eventually. So I got to start thinking a lot more long-term things like minimizing injuries, you know, building up your muscle mass over time. And I just see guys like, you know, like Taylor Atwood or like Ray Williams, they're like progressing into their thirties or even somebody like David Ricks, who's like in his fifties and hitting PRs, you know, you got to start thinking a lot more long-term, you know, you've got a lot of time focus on minimizing injuries. So you actually have like the highest chance of getting to that level, not try and get it as quickly as possible. You know, you've got time build slowly. Dave Ricks is a good example. It's like, he's had like multiple back injuries where it would like set him out of the gym for like months and comes back and like talk about the short term versus long term. Like Dave Ricks competed against Jesse Norris, who was just blowing up 
like crazy. Like he was about to be the face of powerlifting. Um, maybe, yeah, around the world, you know, and I don't know exact. Yeah. He got popped for some, uh, pre-workout or something. It had like an amphetamine in it or something like that. Um, that's silly, but I don't know what happened to him in that regard. I think he's still lifting, but, but Dave Ricks is still in it. You know what I mean? And they like went head to head. He's like 55 and competing against like one of the strongest lifters. And at the time, I think he was like 24, uh, Jesse Norris. And like just having that approach it seems pretty cool because it's like it's not only like an idea. It's like people, people. I think when you say long term, people think like you're giving up. Like, oh yeah, well, long term, okay, well, I got to hustle. So it's like, how how do you balance like the energy in that's required to like push the progress with also like the long term? Like, I, I I don't know. I guess maybe do you have may not have an answer yet, but like, do you think about that? No, I just. I don't really have an answer to that. Yeah. I'm just trying to emulate some of those people like David Ricks again. Like he was winning like IPF world championships in the eighties and now he's still world-class, you know, squatting over 700 at 93. <laughs> and yeah, even like other people like Dan Bell, for example, like he's been like one of the top super heavyweights for like 10 years. But if you look at 10 years ago, like all those guys were, are gone basically except him. He just like, cons- he wasn't the best back then. But now he is because he just consistently like added a bit of weight, didn't get injured, nothing that like would take him out of the sport, and he's now he's on top. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be cool to see like what happens to like your because you're you're 22 now or 23. I'm at 23. Yeah, 23. So like, I feel like you're still in the circle of generation, like our generation, I suppose. But like the teen lifters, for example, are like on another level above even like you where you were when you were 18 like they're just like every level is just getting better and like everyone who started earlier on is just looking back like god damn it like they're getting so strong like it's cool but it's crazy and i wonder how long that'll last yeah like i my senior year of high school i hit like a 500 pound squat in a meet and like back then that was like huge for a teenager and now like my sponsors on smelling salts we got this other guy and he's in high school and he squatted like 925 in a meet in wraps like it's just insane like how higher the standards are being pushed i want to like that's what is really interesting because i love learning about like how people got like what their journey was and how how they got where they were and like even learning about your experience and like having relatively minimal injury getting to where you are not that that's the reason but it's like you said minimize injury you can keep going for a long time like you can sustain it and get really strong so i think that's really cool um what is your goals for coaching for your coach for coaching side of things do you have any like objective goals in that regard nothing like really specific beyond just like the basic like try and help as many people as i can get stronger and just trying to like general in general learn more about training like see what works for some people and what doesn't like I, I've taken like a ton of courses in university on like theory of like what will help you get stronger, but really like you got to get, you got to actually apply your knowledge to actually take it to the next level. So that's basically it. Just get it to be a better coach and help people. That's awesome. Speaking of helping people, do you want to answer some questions? We got a bunch of them. Sure. Let's go ahead. Okay. So Arian Mona Monfared. I probably spelled that wrong or pronounced that wrong. But he said, when in your powerlifting career should you start using smelling salts? So the way I see smelling salts is basically like it should be like a minimalist thing, like basically like for meets or max outs or like maybe the occasional top set. But like things like that, like belts, smelling salts, like the way I see it, like they're always going to be a benefit. There's no reason you should wait till you're at some subjective level before you start using them, you know. Especially like some stuff like I guess smelling salts, they don't really have that much of a learning curve, but like the first time you use them, they can throw you off, right? So if you're waiting to like your first meet and you really want to hit the lift and then you try it and it throws you off completely, you know, that's going to suck. So like, yeah, basically limit their use, but like you still want to get experience. I don't see any wait, any reason to wait till you're at a certain level. Yeah. I My first time was at a meet and my third deadlift, um, my first meet ever and like... <laughs> It was, I think it was a novel experience because I didn't experience anything like that before. 
but it like really literally like took me out of the lift and um i kind of went insane mentally and then i pulled and then someone asked me how it went i like didn't remember i was like i don't know felt good i guess like yeah i've been uh, at meets but, and i've i've had smelling salts and somebody asked to use them i'm like yeah sure and i give it to them and they they missed their lift and they're like man that threw me off i've never used them before <laughs> oh my god yeah yeah i definitely don't recommend using them first time at a meet especially if you've been doing good at the meet and you've been doing good in training like it can really fuck with you mentally right yeah definitely if you've never used them before especially you don't want to don't try and change variables meet day basically yeah yeah um okay i think this is actually a, a, a chatter as well um he's saying he has adductor pain when sumo deadlifting uh what's the reason and what should i do so i feel really well like the adductors are just going to be used a lot during sumo um i think most little pains like that it's basically just going to come down to load management like you probably just want to start a bit lighter work your way back up like it's basically too much for your adductor to handle so you want to do try and do some movement like keep it moving but like that threshold of pain what i usually do is i say you want to start with something that's low or minimal pain so you can adjust like weight range of motion like you could do a bit of a block pull or even probably not in this case because you want to do sumo but like you could do a different variation that's closer and then basically you try and work your way slowly push that threshold back to making the variables normal so like normal sumo that lift normal range of motion normal intensity while keeping low or minimal pain so basically you're progressively overloading those variables yeah i would add to that if i had anything but I, yeah I, that's especially with sumo you definitely can create a lot of tension in the adductor. i mean it's how you move <laughs> so like you're yeah you're yeah. going to be using the people, adductor yeah a lot of people never I really mean, used guess, it as much before yeah yeah exactly and it might be a new lifter too so yeah just follow what matt said um ben gully asks what's the best way to cut fat while not completely losing all of your strength gains that you've made so what i've always advised people when they're cutting for me is to try and do it actually faster because the way i see it is like most of the strength losses probably come from decreased like training stimulus because you're more fatigued you have less energy so the way I see it, like the less period of time that you actually have in that depleted state, the better. So I usually advise my people when they're cutting, like do like a thousand calorie deficit quicker. And then if you need to, have, like if that becomes hard to do, like have like your refeed weeks or whatever, or like cheat day regularly programmed in. But basically, yeah, try and minimize the time you're actually spent training while cutting. Do you notice it's also like, because it sounds like that's kind of similarly like a, a psychological deficit as well it's like you haven't been yeah, eating a lot too. yeah you know your sleep is probably impacted somewhat maybe maybe not a significant degree but like the refeeds and stuff i find if not physiologically beneficial like psychologically i mean it's going to be physiologically beneficial but like to what degree i think it's probably more to get you out of this like doom cycle of like never-ending dieting that people can get into you know yeah, like the Stronger by Science podcast, I know they went over this, like the science behind refeeds and stuff. And they're like saying like, there may be like some minor benefit, like it increases your metabolic rate. But like the main thing seems to be just diet adherence. Like it's psychologically beneficial, basically. Like you're not like, man, I missed this. So I'm just going to cheat on my diet. It's, you know, mm -hmm. when you know, you when you know, like, oh, okay, like in two days, I'm going to be able to like eat my cheat day or whatever. And I'll be fine. It's a lot easier yeah. to stick to it. Yeah, it's like knowing that there's a reward coming for the for the behavior. And it's not like seven months from now. <laughs> right, it's like yeah. next week. Um Waybill the Real asks you, are you Italian? Yes, I am. I'm like one quarter Italian from my dad's side. Nice. Italian gang represent. I don't know how much percentage I am, but my grandparents were I don't know what percentage, but they share a lot of Italian qualities. I just know that my sister is trying to get me a citizenship in Italy. Uh, because apparently if you have like ancestors who aren't too far removed that lived in Italy, you can go there and live there for three months and get your passport. 
Um, yeah, I looked. I looked into that. I think if as long as you can prove you have a male relative or ancestor, you can get the mm-hmm. what is it citizenship. Yeah, my my sister's boyfriend did the same, did that actually. He's from Brazil and lives in Ireland and like wanted a European citizenship. So they found out that his like great grandfather um, was an Italian and didn't like let go of his citizenship and they stayed there for three months. It's you got to pay like three k, but he made he's able to now he's a European citizen just by that like fact. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah. No is gaboosh. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry if this isn't how it's pronounced. He said, why does it seem like equip lifters never hit depth on squats but get three white lights? I don't know if that's talking about multiply mainly. I assume it is, but I think it's just literally lax judging in a lot of multiply federations. And I think part of that comes about like once you're getting like triple ply suits, like can you actually like hit depth physically or like is that like you're bottoming out so they adjusted the depth accordingly (laughs) but yeah if you're talking about single ply though I would say generally single ply lifters do especially IPF yeah like they won't give it to you it's it's hard to get Uh, get yeah I don't know I don't know if he means wraps too but I think the same thing a lot of wrapped untested federations and wraps tend to have lower standards not all of them of course but like some of them they do yeah they definitely benefit from like the hype. Like they're definitely influenced by the hype of like a lift. If someone's got a huge squat, those judges are like, "Yeah, let's go!" And then they're like, "I don't remember what happened." Void light. Like you can kind yeah, of see the yeah. emotion of emotional attachment. Ur Aaron asks, "God, these names, man. Um, do you think powerlifting is a sport or a hobby due to the lack of interaction against your opponent?" I would definitely say it's a sport. Like, I think a lot of people, they got like, what is it? Like, they're just like, what's the word? Self-depreciating attitude about powerlifting. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's what he meant in this question because he's talking about the direct competition. But I would say, like, maybe at local meets, like, there's usually a bigger gap between people. But, like, I know, like, personally, like, when I went to, like, Worlds, like, there was, like, five of us competing for second. And, like, we're, like, watching the scoreboard, like, making sure our attempts are right. So, like, I definitely felt like I've got to like compete against these people. Like I've got to like, so yeah. And either way, even if you're just competing against yourself, you know, like there's lots of sports like that, like, you know, like running, like people who do marathons and stuff, often they're just trying to beat their own personal best or whatever, you know, it, I still think it's definitely a sport, not a hobby. Yeah. I mean, and it can be a hobby, but like, even if it's a hobby, it doesn't mean it's not a sport either. It's yeah, not even yeah, that like too. They're not mutually, mutually exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. I feel like you can think about 8 million examples for that. Like I play video games all the time and like Overwatch is a sport. Um, but I don't think of it as a, like it is a sport period. I treat it as a hobby. I'm not super competitive, (laughs) you know? So it's fun for me. Right. Yeah. But like you said, this question has like been asked for every single year that I've competed in lifting or, or coached. It's like, oh, it's just a hobby. Why do you care so much? And I remember getting so offended by that because it's like, well, I want it to be my life. So that's why I care. And that's why it matters. And also people are paying me to care about it more than the average person. So that's why I care about it. You know, that's why I care about being right, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, Ryan asks, are you planning on cutting so that you can become a bit more lean? Um, I was actually thinking about that. So right now I'm probably going to cut because I need to make 93 to get a world spot or apply for the world spot. I'll be like the second ranked person applying for it now that I'm an open, but yeah, but I was actually planning on that from like, I was talking about the long-term progress. Like I'm trying to fill out the 105 class. So my plan was to bulk to like around 235 pounds and then probably compete. I was going to compete then. And then after that, I was going to do cut to cut fat and then rebuild up and basically cycle like that cutting and bulking cycles trying to increase my relative proportion of muscle at a given weight for 105 so yeah yeah getting lean and getting competitive sounds like uh i'll go to a twitch comment uh Sully kama asked how long is it how long is too long to spend training at 90 percent plus weights dup three times a week heavy day weights are five triples at 93% right now. That sounds like 
really aggressive. <laughs> yeah. So like usually for me, a three rep max would be 93%. Like that's historically what it's been. So like five triples <laughs> of that. I wonder if you're, yeah, if that's actually like RP 10 sets, but yeah, I think over 90, like I'll do singles, like over 90% a lot. Like uh, I'll have weeks where I'll do it multiple times. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. Just doing, I think most people's RP eight singles for an average training day are going to come out around 90%. So I think it's, yeah, I don't think it's necessary. It depends, you know, like when you're talking actual working sets like that over 90%, then yeah, you're probably don't want to do much of that. I wouldn't probably not do that outside of an actual like peak for a meet versus just a general single like top set once in a while or even once a week at over 90%. I think that's fine. So yeah, I guess it depends on the context. Yeah. And I think most lifters when they're starting out um, have a... a difficult time understanding that like your fatigue related to this the thing that you're doing is kind of where you make that decision like if you're doing five triples at 93 percent and like you're feeling good doing that like you're probably good doing that um i think since we're kind of like both we're both coaches i think we look at it more so what's the risk to to reward there and like most people <laughs> I would say like if it's truly 93% of like your current estimated max or your current potential max, that's, that's a lot. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, like your ability is high. you you can handle a lot if you can do that. However, what likely happens is that that's no longer your max. And so 93% is based off of like a previous judgment, like from like a few weeks ago. So like you probably are getting stronger. Um, that's why like, for example, I, I use RP in my coaching so that it's never like, it's never a static number. And like in yours, you mentioned like for your own programming for yourself, like you do pretty sub max loads most of the time. So it's not like the deviance or the, the variance isn't so, so small where like if you're off by five pounds, it's going to be an RP 10. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That too. Um. Yeah. If you can, And then he said, I got my five by five to 90%. Uh, yeah, I think you're getting stronger if you're doing five by five at 90% because that's again pretty, yeah, that's literally the percent I use for my five rep max, too. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I assume, like, especially if you're somebody who's like a more like lower, like beginner weight, like if you're at like a 300 pound max before, it's not unheard of for you to put like 30 pounds or 40 pounds on your lifts in one cycle. Yesterday, I was streaming and I was talking about, um, starving um <laughs> i was talking about ruining your metabolism well I, I wasn't abby was um my girlfriend and uh i was saying like hey well there's not really like a, a your metabolism doesn't like go into starvation mode he wants to know your thoughts on that starvation mode like that yeah i think most yeah. of the difference is because like um like the thermal effect of feeding like digesting food itself burns calories right and a lot of people, so if you're like literally fasting all day, like you're not going to be digesting. So your basal met, your TDE is going to go down because of that. But I don't think it's like, I don't think it's actual. There is a starvation mode. I think that's just like what's happening is it's essentially the same as doing like if you did less physical activity, you know, your metabolism didn't go down. You're just doing less. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say I'm not that super well versed in it. So I don't know if there's more to it than that, but that's what I my knowledge on the subject is i kind of became a big nerd on nutrition early on before i got into lifting and like one of the it could be this this could be different now but i from my understanding is it's that but also be so it's your your thermic effect of food is down but then also the energy that you're actually getting from food is less so then your um neat your non-exercise activity thermogenesis is lower as well so what that means in, in layman terms is like when you're eating less, you're probably not going to be moving around as much. You know, you're not going to be as like fidgety, for example, like just move me like moving around like this, like it is, it is some level of ex uh, energy that I'm expending. Um, another example would be like, do you, when you have a lot more food that you're eating, maybe you're also spending more time cooking. And when you're cooking, you're moving around, like grabbing dishes and doing the dishes and taking the trash out and stuff like that. Maybe when you eat less food, you have less energy to like do those chores that would otherwise 
cause you to expend energy. Um, and especially when your energy, when your actual body fat percentage goes down and your body has less energy to take from like your, your cells, like your fat cells and hopefully not your muscle cells, but sometimes muscle, but usually carbohydrate, uh, through glycogen and then your fat cells, the less you have of that to take from, like your body's going to probably, uh, cue you to move around less because you don't got a lot more to 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 use so i think that's usually what happens it's less like ruining the metabolism they did a starvation study from it was actually in minnesota have you heard of the starvation study the minnesota um i'm surprised i didn't think of this yesterday but it was like unethical like they can't replicate it because it was like in the 20s and they like literally starved people for like i don't know how long maybe two weeks or something um and they, I mean, they gave them water and stuff, but they got to like really low, low uh, body weight. And they like tracked their metabolic function from that point to like a, a recovery period. And pretty much everybody's like metabolic rate returned to normal as they gained back their body fat and body mass. And so like one of the things is that your body, your body will slow down its uh, met metabolic rate to a a degree but it's only one to literally reach the threshold of like very low fat because now you have less testosterone that you can produce um there's less available like hormone there's le less hormone availability which can impact metabolism to some degree um and then you are like slowing down but like again you're also like not moving <laughs> you're you know you're starving and then also it returns to normal um from the majority of people unless you have like a thyroid um issue that doesn't return to baseline when you return your body weight to normal. Um, okay. Is that good? Hopefully it's a good answer to the question. Um, is it possible for someone to have such poor mobility that they should never deadlift or squat? Well, I think there would be a, like at that given time when they have that super poor mobility, they probably get a better training response doing other exercises, like better stimulation but I still think they should try and build up their mobility for deadlifts and squats as well. And I would say the best way to do that is just do actual squats and deadlifts, but like push that threshold of mobility. So you're not as much focused on moving the most weight, you know, you're just trying to more focusing on progressing your range of motion and then focusing, you know, like for example, squats, you're doing like leg extensions for your quads to actually stimulate them, training response, hypertrophy, strength, whatever. You had a good video about um, a calf on calves um, yeah, and how yeah. like one potential benefit of training them for a powerlifter is like to potentially increase ankle mobility. Yeah. Can you speak on that a second? Right. Yeah. So that's a big thing is a lot of people think like strength training doesn't build mobility. Stretching is what builds mobility when in reality it's like both will work mobility and strength training is very good for mobility. And I think a lot of times what people think is like my tissues cannot move this much it's actually like you're just really unstable like you haven't built like motor patterns to move through that range of motion so doing actual strength training helps you build mobility in that range of motion so what i said in that video was basically somebody asked the benefits of calves for powerlifting i said a lot of people their squats they have ankle mobility issues so if you train calf raises with like good range of motion you know you're building that range of motion at your ankle joint that will benefit your squat how long are your training blocks you said three weeks usually is how long your so, like yeah. micro cycles yeah last i do or... three week micro cycles usually i'll have like a meet plan so like the whole cycle is like that point to the meet where if it's like really long like i have a meet in like say like 40 weeks i'll break it up into two where i'll reset in the middle but if i don't have a meet planned i just kind of run it indefinitely adding weight and then once the progress is like at the point like i can't keep adding weight i'll just reset again mm -hmm. um Ryan asks, should we or can we switch to sumo after a few months of conventional or should we wait a few years to switch? I think it's just like the thing I said before. There's no, I don't see really any reason to wait at all, especially since I think I did a video on this, but I think most people will probably be stronger long term doing sumo. So like, again, it's like one of those things, like why limit yourself by waiting until you're at some arbitrary point? Like, it's not like something about sumo is like, if you don't do it, if you do it when you're not strong enough. You're not going to do it well. Like it's just, it's just mm -hmm. like anything else. You have to learn to do it. There's no point in waiting. It's like one of the weirdest things that like 
powerlifters like are unironically um interested in is like whether or not sumo or conventional is like more more masculine or like more whatever like <laughs> it's not real lifting unless you do conventional or something right yeah uh ryan asks again oh you already did a video on how to program for yourself so watch matt's video on how to program for himself um <laughs> unless you want to answer more about that right i can just go over it quickly it's basically like you want to like i recommended find a pre-made program first that works for you and that can be from a coach or like um a pre-made like program out there like candido or shiko's programs or just trial and error but it's probably easier to get somebody to make it for you and then once you find something that works for you basically you make small changes week to week or not week to week sorry cycle to cycle basically that you think might benefit you experiment with different stuff and then again just basically try and learn more about programming there's tons of resources online so try and consume as much you can learn as much as you can but that's the basics yeah yeah i'll just add like i i think it's okay if you're just starting out to try a, diff- a bunch of different like whether it's programs or protocols or like however gran- granular you want to change things like just make sure you're paying attention to what's happening because if you change a lot and you aren't paying attention to like why you're changing it, um, you might miss uh, some important variables, you know? And so I think that's why it's nice to run a pre-made program because you have less to decide on and arguably you might not, like programming itself might not be the, the, the variable for you for the first few weeks or months, you know, might just be can you even perform the movements properly? Like, are you getting sleep? Like some of the external stressors and things like that might be need to, like you might need to prioritize that first. And then it's like, are you even tracking your training? You know, are you, are you recording what you need to record so that you can make decisions later on for what's better and whatnot. But if you do want to change things early on, I think that's also good. Similar to like, if you want to do sumo because you feel like it might work better, test it out because you can kind of do that with programs too it's just i think it's also hard because of like anchoring bias to know what is actually the thing that's driving the progress because you might think you change something and you get better and and then that's the thing that got made you better and you might stick that for a long time expecting similar results but it's actually like the novelty itself was the thing that got you stronger so maybe you got to keep keep changing things up until you find like a really good sweet spot that you can sustain for a long time um serif sarlift log asks there was an interesting study showing full rom had greater uh, so full range of motion had greater carryover than partial range of motion which vi- what which violates the specificity law oh i think i know the, the study is talking about the lift used equals smith bench thoughts medium Grip, bench press, and off season. I don't know. So the range of motion thing, I think I know the studies talking about where they had people do like partial range of motion versus full range of motion training. And then they tested their strength, like everybody's strength at partial range of motion and full range of motion. And the full range of motion did better than the partial range of motion group on partial range of motion strength. And yeah, I think it it doesn't you could say it violates the specificity principle, but the way I see it, like they, they are training that joint angle, that range of motion still, but they're also getting more. And you know, there's going to be carryover from the one range of motion of the movement to the other. So you could almost say it's like, they're getting the same specificity and they're also getting more training volume because they're doing the other range of motion. Right. So I don't think it necessarily violates the specificity principle. And more muscle mass to use on the partial range of motion too. And then the last question, unless you guys on Twitch have any questions, um, is why are you so strong? I don't really think there's anything special. Like I get people asking me that and I just think it's like, it's really mainly like the basics. Like if you, if you had to add up, like what makes your progress in lifting? Like I'd say like good mindset, making sure you get decent sleep, making sure you get like enough calories and protein and having a decent program. That's like 90% of the progress. And then like all the other little mm-hmm. stuff, like it helps, but like, I don't think there's any like one secret other than just like the basics really done consistently over time. Scientists hate him. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> um, okay. The any any other questions, you guys? On on. Uh, wait, is my? Oh, I thought my thing wasn't working. Yeah, any other questions on Twitch? Um, if not, we appreciate you being here. Um, Matt, yeah, I appreciate you hopping in, Thanks talking for, for two me. hours about lifting. Fun. I love talking about lifting, so definitely enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I was pumped. I was like, oh, hey, you want to do this? You're like, yeah. It's like, sweet. Here's a link. We're smooth yeah. as. So, yeah. yeah. I uh, I don't have much more to add, man, but I really appreciate you sharing all about your, your own um, experiences. Like I said, I've been following your progress for a while, and I've just always thought, damn, bro. Because... And I want to add this, and I should have added it earlier. Like you mentioned it in the beginning, like you didn't look like someone who's gonna be like kicking ass in powerlifting. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like you, you, there's like Russ Swole, and he's Russ Swole. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's then, really strong. Yeah. He's really jacked. It makes sense. Like you're really strong, and I think you're jacked too. But you don't have like the the physique. Yeah, that people are like, wow, that guy can deadlift. Yeah, do people think you can deadlift and squat as much as you do when you like walk around? Definitely not. Like, um, especially when I go to like new gyms, like people like aren't used to seeing me train. Like, and then they'll come up to me like, wow, I didn't think somebody your size could do that. And then they're also kind of surprised how much I weigh because I'm walking around at like 225 pounds now, and I definitely don't think I look like I'm 225 pounds. And they're mm. kind of surprised. Yeah. True. If there's anything you guys can learn from this episode, it's that uh, you don't really know what you don't know until you try it out. Um, so that's the moral. All right, guys. I will end the stream now. I don't know how to end podcasts, so I'm just going to end it. Okay, bye. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do an actual outro at some point. But right. yeah, I do appreciate it. I ended the stream. Um, if you ever want to do this again, just let me know. I'll right. probably ping you at some point. I'll be down for sure. Cool, man. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna go get me. some food. Say hi to my, right, my girlfriend. I locked myself in the room for a while. <laughs> yeah. See you later. <laughs>